In this video and the next series of videos, we're going to introduce the concept of virtual work or the unit load method for calculating the deflections of trusses. We can also extend this method later on for calculating the forces in indeterminate trusses. So in statics, we always dealt with determinate trusses, but if we have trusses that maybe have cross bracing, which is very common in practice, we need alternative methods on top of what we know from statics to be able to calculate those forces. Before we can go into this virtual work or unit load method, I want to first introduce or reintroduce a few preliminaries that come from the topic strength of materials. So first concept I'd like to reintroduce is conservation of energy. And this simply states that any work, I'm using capital U for work, done on a body, so external, so I'm using E for external, must be equal to the work done inside the body, so I for internal. So E equals external, I equals internal. So external work equals internal work. So we need to go that little bit further to actually say, what do we mean by external work and internal work? So first of all, external work. And we're going to restrict our attention at the moment, although it's perfectly valid, just to bars. So the elements that we use to make up a truss structure. So we can imagine we have a bar that is going to be used in a truss or a single truss element and I fully fix it on one side and I apply an external force to the right hand side F and as a result of applying the external force F my bar will have extended it might have also got slightly thinner as well. That's the concept of Poisson's ratio that is also introduced in strength of materials. So our bar has now extended due to having this force F on it by a small amount that I'm recalling dx. And we're gonna state the definition of work so work equals force times distance. So in this case, we would have F times DX. So if I now draw a graph where I keep increasing this force F, And I'm going to draw the force F on the Y axis. And I'm going to call the distance from which the bar extends X. And so a small increment DX would be here on the X axis. And as a result of applying this forces F, I would get up to a total displacement of what I'm going to call delta. So I used d axis for a small bit of displacement, but the total displacement from applying increments of F up until some maximum force of P would result in a deflection of delta. And we can then use our force times distance is actually this area under the graph. And I might even want to say that this function is a function f of x. So my external work done, ue, 
equals the integral between 0 and x of f of x, so the function of the loading function with displacement dx. And when I carry out that integration, you can see we've got a linear function and it's the area underneath. So u e equals one half of p times delta. So we're now going to extend the same kind of idea but for the internal work done. So again, we imagine a bar that will have some external forces on it that will generate some internal forces. I'm going to call this internal force N. So equal and opposite, it must be subjected to external forces equal to the magnitude of N. And this is the actual force within the bar. And this bar, I imagine it's got a circular cross section, doesn't matter what the cross sectional shape is, but it does have an area of A. As a result of having the forces applied to it, the bar will extend and will extend in total by an amount delta. And now we need to introduce some concepts from strength of materials before we finally work out what the extension of this bar would be. So from strength of materials and Hooke's laws, we can define that the stress in this bar, sigma, is equal to the Young's modulus multiplied by the strain. And this is just a stating Hooke's law for a linear elastic material. And we can also rewrite this statement then that the sigma equals force divided by area, where it's the internal force in the bar. We can also define from strength of materials a simple version of strain. There are much more complicated versions of strain. So the strain equals the change in length delta divided by the original length L. So we're going to go back to our original Hooke's law. Sigma equals Young's modulus times strain. And we're going to substitute that for sigma was equal to force divided by area, which was equal to Young's modulus multiplied by the change in length divided by the original length. And then we're going to rearrange for delta. So rearranging this equation in terms of delta, we get for delta equals N L divided by A E. And this is a relatively well-known formula for calculating the deflection of a single bar. So like we did last time for external work, we can similarly draw a graph of force versus displacement where this goes to a maximum value of n and at a maximum value of delta we have a straight line because we're linear elastic we're assuming Hooke's law and again we have the area underneath this graph is equal to the internal work done so in this case ui equals one half of n delta and we can also take our 
resolve just above for delta and insert it into this equation. So substituting for delta now, we can say that ui equals n squared l divided by 2ae. And so we're going to use these concepts to introduce ourselves to the concept of virtual work. And now I'm going to give a very informal explanation of the concept of virtual work before we go into a more formal definition. So we're going to imagine a small scenario where I have a bar of original length L. I'm also going to subject that bar to a unit load of one. Well, let's call that, could call that P dash if we like. And we'd also like to subject that bar to a real load, which I'm going to call P. So as a result of the unit load, my bar would undergo internal work due to forces little n. And as a result of applying this small unit load, would undergo a small displacement little delta. Likewise, due to the application of P, the real loads, the bar would be subject to internal forces, capital N, and would undergo a displacement of capital delta. So let's just remind ourselves. So little delta, the deflection would be equal to NL divided by A. E. But capital delta would be equal to NL divided by A, E. As this is linear elastic, we can kind of work out the ratios. So N over 1 would be equal to delta over delta. Or rearranging this formula, we could say that delta equals n times little delta. And now substituting for little delta, we could say that big delta, the actual deflection of the beam, would be n n l divided by a e. So if we know and this is where we're going to use the concept later on. If we know how much deflection we would get from the application of a unit load, then we can find the multiplier, and in this case, that multiplier, let's put it, we can just multiply up the deflection due to a unit load by the real load to get the deflection in the total, in the, in the bar, subject to the real load. However, this is where things get slightly complicated. In this situation, we only had one bar. In real life, we might have a truss, and let's draw the simplest truss I possibly can. And uh, let's have a roller here. And uh, let's have a point load P on a 10, a real load of 10, some dimensions as usual. Let's go for three, four, let's call it meters. Maybe this is kilonewtons. So if I wanted to find out what the deflection of this point here on the truss is, if I could find out what the deflection was down to unit load, I could find a way of multiplying by the real load what would happen. However, so we're going to extend the concept. Here we've had 
a concept that is scalar, and we want to extend that concept to a more vectorial concept. So we know if we have a unit load applied at this point, how much would go into the diagonal beam, how much would go into the so rod, how much would go into the horizontal rod or bar, how much would go into this bar, and therefore how much work would go into each of the individual bars. So we're going to show a little bit more formally in the next video, but for now, we're just going to simply state the concept that the delta, and at this point we're wanting the delta measured at this point in a vertical direction, would be equal to the sum of the real loads in each of the bars. So I'm going to give this an I for a counter. So maybe this is I equals 1 to N bars times by the real loads, so the unit loads in the bar, multiplied by L again. That changes for each bar, A and E. And if we like, we can even change the areas and the Young's modulus for each of the bars. And we're going to go into a more formal definition of this and some worked examples using the method in the next couple of videos.